What's up, everyone? Welcome to this day in Philly Sports History for September 12th, 2024. I'm your host, Jim Montgomery. Welcome to a Thursday edition of the podcast. NFL Week 2 kicks off tonight. But first, a couple quick housekeeping notes. First, I left a big detail out yesterday during the this day. Uh, I mentioned that... The Phillies beat the Mets 11-9, 13 innings. They used the 10 pitchers, which was a team record. They set the team record for home runs. The two teams combined for the Major League Baseball record with 18 pitchers used. I did mention that Ryan Howard pinch hit in that game and hit a home run. Happened to be his first career home run. Should have mentioned that little small detail, uh, but they did set the record. And yesterday... In 2004, Ryan Howard, as a pinch hitter, hit his first career home run. So, meant to mention that. Completely skipped it over on my notes. And as I always say, I like to make sure I'm giving you as much of the factual and truthful information as I can. So, Ryan Howard hit that home run yesterday was his first. Be sure to follow the YouTube account and subscribe at Jimbo underscore Mont. Twitter and TikTok, Jimbo underscore Mont as well. Spread the word. Tell your friends. Hit me up on Facebook, Instagram, at Philly Jimbo, LinkedIn. Whatever you need to do, spread the word. Let's continue to grow these things as we head into year three. Lots of good things on the horizon. Gearing up for this year's Philadelphia Sports Hall of Fame induction ceremony. Any of the information you need regarding the inductees as well as ticket information is in the description as we get closer i'll do a little bit more on this year's inductees and uh, as we start getting confirmations let you know who's attending and all things like that so stay tuned for that but if you want some information now all the information you need is in the description all right so let's recap yesterday's question of the day we were talking we have been talking i should say about philly philly sports villains Yesterday, we talked about DeMarco Murray, and I asked you, is he the worst free Eagles free agent of all time? And honestly, it was not even close. Namdi Asawa, with 100% of the votes, people were writing in about how terrible he was, uh, the, telling their own stories about how they felt. So Namdi Asawa, as voted by you, is the worst Philadelphia, or Eagles free agent of all time. And quite honestly, it's hard to argue that. Came in with so much hype. And then the complete 180 once he got here. Something tells me we'll have more on him later in the Philly Sports Villains feature. But thank you as always for participating in the question of the day. There'll be another one later in the show. 267-495-8531. That's the number to the Back to the Future voice and text line. Get anything Philly sports related off your chest. Really starting to get a lot of good comments. Uh, Still not so many voicemails yet. Lots of text though. Uh, I will have hopefully some voicemail clips to play later in the week as the Phillies gear up for the Mets series. Speaking of those Phils, nothing spectacular to be honest. It was just one of those ho-hum type of games. 3-2, to Zach Wheeler was his normal dominant self. Cassianos hit a two home two run home run because of course he did. It was just one of those very business like focused, and I like what I'm seeing in, uh, with this team recently. I feel like they're really kicking it into gear right now at the right time. Uh, day off today before three against the Mets and then three against the Brewers. Really, these next six games, there's no reason why they can't clinch a playoff spot and really whittle down that magic number uh, even more. Currently, they're up eight games on the Mets, four and a half on the Brewers, one on the Dodgers. And as I keep saying, it doesn't matter as long as they get one of those two first round buys. The magic number is officially now under double digits to win the division, nine games to win the division over the Mets right now. Seven, I believe, if I did my math correct, to clinch a playoff spot. Shouldn't have an issue, and I'm going to knock on wood because we we all know the stories of the fold in 64. Uh, but things are looking up and up for the Phils right now. Buckle up. The next week is going to be a lot of fun. Actually, probably week plus because then there's four games up in New York on the other side of that Brewers series. But 
crunch time. We're coming down the home stretch here in baseball season. Let's clinch that division. Let's clinch at least minimum a two seed, get that by, and gear up for another red October. Be sure to check out my boys at the Clashing Conferences podcast. New football podcast dropped today. Can't wait to listen to that. Uh, really just saw some lives from Topher and should be interesting. The Daniel Jones apologist himself. Uh, anxious to see what he has to say, though, for real. Uh, I've seen some things on Twitter that he said, but that's available wherever you get your podcast. And then the new baseball episode drops tomorrow. They're doing some good things over there. Uh, as you know, I spent a couple weeks ago, did a baseball episode with them. Lots of fun. Planning on doing some football with them as well. So that is available wherever you get your podcast, as well as on YouTube. And then go to Philly Goat, do a little shopping, uh, gear up and get ready for hockey season, which Flyers rookies report today. Uh, and then training camp gets underway next week. And then right down over the horizon is the Sixer season. Philly Goat has you covered. Go to Philly Goat. Use the promo code Jim Montgomery to take 10% off your order. That's phillygoat.com, promo code Jim Montgomery for 10% off your order. All right, it is Monday Night Football Week, and what a quirky start to the NFL season for the Eagles. I mean, you had the Friday night game and then Monday night, and I'm just not a fan. I guess 24 years ago when I first got tickets, loved primetime games because it meant a full day of tailgating, uh, which meant drinking, eating, whatever. Uh, Now I'm like, give me a 1 o'clock Sunday game so I can get it done and over with, eat dinner, and be in bed by 8 o'clock. But we have the extra day to wait, but we do have some Eagles news. Yesterday, Vic Fangio spoke with the media, basically confirmed that, or I shouldn't even say basically, confirmed that N'Kobe Dean is still starting again this week over Devin White, which I think is the right move. Uh, Whether or not Devin White is legitimately hurt or it's just one of those things to kind of protect him as how he's trying to plan his next move, I don't know. But I I feel overall, N'Kobe Dean didn't play that bad. He certainly has earned the spot again to play alongside Zach Vaughn. Um, The other big news he said was that uh, Bryce Huff just kind of is one of the guys right now and he needs to separate himself in order to get more playing time and the thing I like about uh, Vic Fangio is he's, he tells it like it is and I mean and I also like that because of his his history and his career he sort of has the the autonomy to do what he wants so just because they're paying him uh, 50 million dollars or whatever it is, doesn't mean he's going to get guaranteed playing time and he's going to put the best team he can out there. Uh, So I really, really like that. And hopefully Huff can kind of separate himself because that is one of the issues going into the Falcons is the pass rush because Kirk Cousins might suck on prime time. He might be 150 years old, but I mean, he, he will pick you apart if he's not pressured. And and we've seen it when he does get pressured He can turn the ball over. So that's a key piece, uh, but we'll get more into that uh, on Monday when we break down the keys to the game. But a lot of talk because of the pass rush about Hassan Redick, who obviously the Eagles traded with the Jets and who is now holding out. And a lot of talk about how the Eagles should, should bring him back. Now, it's not quite as easy as just calling up Joe Douglas and saying, hey, let's work out a trade. Because I don't know if it's ever been done where you trade a player and then trade him back. There's a lot of intricacies that are tied to this pick. And I guess the other thing is you're dealing with two very stubborn men. Because for them, for the Eagles to make this trade, Howie Roseman and Joe Douglas essentially have to admit they made a mistake uh, and Joe Douglas worked under Howie Roseman, so they're pro- mostly from the same ilk. And I don't necessarily see that happening. Uh, I also don't necessarily see Joe Douglas budging on the whole situation and really working something out. He said, no, the, you, you got to come in and play. Uh, but it, it is an interesting sort of, of side sort of story here because obviously Hassan Reddick will – make the Eagles better. They do have some cap space. I don't know if he'd come back 
and not get a long-term deal for what he's worth. The Eagles certainly are not going to pay him. Um, but I would not rule this out only in the sense that because of how similar Joe Douglas and Howie Roseman are, somehow I think they can work it out where both guys sort of don't lose face, even though we all know they both would be admitting they made a mistake. So stay tuned for that. I don't think anything's going to come out of it, though. Uh, but enough people were talking about it yesterday. I figured I'd bring it up, which leads me to the question of the day for today. Should the Eagles kick the tires on Hassan Raddick? I'm not going to say will they bring him back, but should they? Um, and you got to keep in mind that there were reports that he may have been the the guy in the locker room leaking rep- uh, the, the stories out and really causing and stirring the pot. However, he would certainly make this pass rush better. So tell me what you think. Should the Eagles bring back Hassan Reddick? 267-495-8531. That'll get you into the Back to the Future voice and text line. Let me know your thoughts on that. Anything else Philly sports related? I want to talk Phillies Mets, Flyers training camp, whatever you want. It's all fair game. So that number again is 267-495-8531. That's the Back to the Future voice and text line. And then finally, Saquon Barkley, no surprise there, is the NFC Offensive Player of the Week. I have a feeling this is going to be the first of multiple times that he receives that award this year. All right, I mentioned the Flyers. Rookie camp opens today. Training camp opens next week. There was a little bit of a Sixers story yesterday, too. Apparently at the Pearl Jam concert, uh, the bassist was wearing a white Sixers jersey that looked similar to the Spectrum City Connect jerseys from a couple years ago. And it, nobody's confirmed it yet, but it sure seems that that's going to be the Sixers City Connect jerseys. And honestly, I like them. I liked the blue ones when they wore them, uh, but the white just gives it a cleaner look. I, there's something about a white jersey with certain colors on it that just pops. Um, and if you want to, to see them, just do Pearl Jam Sixers City Connect jersey, and I'm sure something will come up. But I really like them. Like I said, I liked the navy blue ones when they had them. But the white ones, is just with that color pattern with the the, the rainbow spectrum symbol, just look good. So go check that out. Uh, But let me know. If you want to let let me know what you think about those City Connect jerseys as well. I will say the Sixers, for the most part, to their credit, and I guess it's not really them that does it. It's Nike. But they've done a good job with their City Connect unlike a certain other baseball team that plays across the street. Uh, But that was leaked uh, from the Pearl Jam concert. And like I said, if that's the case, I might buy one because I really, really thought they looked nice. All right, today, we're going to go back to 1999. And on this day in 1999, the Cardinals beat the Eagles 25-24 at the Vet. This was Andy Reid's debut as head coach of the Eagles. Uh... The game was blacked out locally, believe it or not. So think about that. The game was blacked out, and this was, what, 25 years ago? The game was blacked out. Uh, I don't know if the NFL does it still to this day because the Eagles are just never, I mean, it's always a sellout now at the link. But back then, they did not sell out this game at Veterans Stadium. Uh, only 64,000 of the 65,000 tickets were sold. And typically, a lot of local businesses would buy up the tickets so it wasn't blacked out. For some reason, I guess they just weren't high on Andy Reid and the Eagles. Um, But, hey, it is what it is. Uh, However, Andy Reid in his debut, nobody really saw it on TV. And the Eagles jumped out early in this game, 21-0 in the first quarter. Uh, Deuce Staley had two touchdowns, a rushing and a receiving. And then uh, Luther Broughton caught a touchdown pass from one Doug Peterson, who was happened to be making his first NFL start. Uh, remember, he was sort of the, the placeholder for Donovan McNabb until he was ready to be the starter. And, I mean, it was a sloppy first quarter. Three turnovers for the Cardinals, two for the Eagles. But... After that, it sort of just spiraled out of control for for the Eagles. They did lead twenty four to lead twenty four to six at halftime, and then Jake the Snake Plummer took over in the second half as he always did back then. 
led the Cardinals to a comeback. The Eagles still had the lead late and had a chance to ice it. Doug Peterson had a third and four from the Eagles 49. Andy Reid had talked about it in the postgame press conference. He had been setting this play up the entire game, called for a deep pass. They did a fake slant, and Peterson had Brian Finneran out of Villanova running right down the sideline. Likely he may have scored or at least would have gotten deep in the Falcons ter- or Cardinals territory and would have iced the game. However, I vividly remember the replays of this. Finneran bobbled the pass and ended up being intercepted by the Cardinals who drove down to kick the game-winning field goal. And that play there really would have set the tone for the Andy Reid era, starting it off with a win. Instead, the Eagles went 5-11. Donovan eventually took over as the starter. But I will say, saw something in Andy Reid that we hadn't seen under, at that point, it would have been Rich Kotite and then Ray Rhodes. But you saw the promise that this team was. And I think that's when things started to shift from a ticket sales standpoint. I talked about the game being blacked out. And I remember a year later when they made the playoffs, being in Veterans Stadium for that game against Tampa Bay when the Eagles won. And then following the following year, called them up and was like, I'm getting season tickets. And I could have gotten as many season tickets as I wanted back then in 2001. Now the waiting list is like 800 years. Like I think you can have a better shot of seeing Haley's Comet than getting Eagles tickets. So Andy Reid in this game, despite the loss, despite being sloppy, I think really set the tone for his tenure in Philly. And the Eagles had a chance to win it. Uh, and it was funny too, as I was reading through uh, the old newspaper archives and the, the sports writers were like, everybody hated Doug Peterson, even the sports writers, because I think nobody really wanted to see him play. Everybody wanted Donovan to have a shot. So poor Dougie P. Little did we know back in 99 when we were all booing him for being the quarterback, he would come back how many ever years later, 18 years later, and lead us to our first Super Bowl. But on this day, back in 2000 or 1999, Andy Reid made his coaching debut with the Eagles, a 25-24 loss to the Cardinals, a game in which they led 21-0, 24-6, and had a chance to ice it. But Villanova's Brian Finneran, who would go on to star for the Falcons, um, ironically enough, not in Philly, but did star in Atlanta, bobbled the pass and led to the interception. As a Temple guy, there is a Villanova joke in there. But I don't want to offend anybody on a Thursday. But that all happened back in 1999. All right, continuing our look at Philly sports villains. These are players who have ties to the Philadelphia area, whether they were born here, played here, who became villains throughout their career and to this day still are in many cases. There are a couple of exceptions we'll talk about later this month. But today we're going to talk about J.D. Drew. And J.D. Drew, the Phillies drafted him second overall back in 1997. Despite the fact that Scott Boris said he's not going to sign for anything less than like 10 or $11 million. Uh, I saw conflicting reports on what he wanted. Uh, Phillies said, no, you'll, you'll sign. And took him anyway. Offered him about $3 million. He refused to sign, played in the Independent League for 1997 and to start 1998. Went back into the Major League Baseball draft. Cardinals took him number five overall. Uh, offered him definitely less than the 10 or 11 million. Uh, I think essentially he just didn't want to play in Philly. He thought that, uh, I mean, at the time, the Phillies were terrible. Just didn't want to have any part of it. Uh, Of course, his first appearance in Philly led to a lot of loud boos and the infamous batteries being thrown at him. And listen, I am the voice of the fan. I will stick up when people rip Philly fans all the time, but I don't condone this. This is not our best moment. Just idiotic, to be completely honest. Uh, And so, I mean, things like this do happen at other stadiums as well, but because it's Philly, it's just fun to pile on and pick on us. But not our best moment. A stupid, stupid moment. Sure, boo him loudly. That's perfectly fine. Uh, But don't throw batteries. Come on, man. 
Um, ultimately, J.D. Drew did have a solid career. Hit 278 with 242 home runs. Made one All-Star game. Won a World Series with the Red Sox. I think he played like 14 years. Not quite the Mickey Mantle le- level that everybody thought he was going to be or projected him to be. Uh, but, I mean, solid, serviceable major league career. I mean, I, I think a lot of kids t- t- like would t- take that career and say, hey, I was a successful major league baseball player. Um, and I will say, I mean, his his take on playing in Philly was somewhat justifiable. As I mentioned, the team was terrible. They were run like a small market club. Uh, if you remember back then, that was like the big talk. Like, we're, we're a small market team. And it's like, no, you're in the fifth largest market at the time in the country. You're not a small market team. Uh, Philly fans obviously were not happy that they got spurned. They also were not happy with the way the team was playing uh, and being run. So it was so, sort of that perfect storm. Um but again, I'm going to justify it here that J.D. Drew was correct in not wanting to play here. He's still a dick. Don't get me wrong. Um, one of those guys that I can't stand. Like I, I talk a lot of times about a punchable face. J.D. Drew has a very punchable face. Um, but, I mean, I, I, I think if I was coming out being touted as the next Mickey Mantle, I'd much rather play St. Louis than Philadelphia too. Especially at the time. But as things were playing out here with J.D. Drew and then a couple years later you had the Scott Rowland uh, saga. Meanwhile, Ed Wade's behind the scenes and he was building a farm system that eventually would win the World Series. Um, too bad he was gone and didn't get the the to eat his cake, I guess you could say. But uh, to his credit, Pat Gillick did give Ed Wade credit for building the core of that World Series team. So while J.D. Drew wasn't a part of it, Ed Wade was behind the scenes cooking some stuff up. But today's Philly sports villain is one of my, uh, can't stand, like I said, punchable face, J.D. Drew, uh, who spurned the Phillies, who drafted him number two overall, uh, played independent ball, set out a year, and ended up having a, a solid uh, not spectacular. I mean, he made an all-star team, major league career. I kind of get the sense, too, that that all-star was sort of like a lifetime achievement award for him. Uh, but we won't get into that. But J.D. Drew, today, today's Philly sports villain. On this day back in 1999, Andy Reid made his Eagles coaching debut with a 25-24 loss to the Arizona Cardinals. Eagles led 24-6 to at halftime. Had a chance to ice it late, and Brian Finneran blew it for Dougie P and Andy Reid. Um, if you can tell, I'm not a big Brian Finneran fan. Still harbor some resentment from this day 25 years ago, but I digress. Be sure to let me know your thoughts on Hassan Reddick. Should the Eagles kick the tire? Is it even worth entertaining? Keeping in mind that likely will not happen because you have two very stubborn individuals who don't want to admit that they were wrong uh, in Howie Roseman and Joe Douglas. But is it worth taking a look? 267-495-8531. That'll get you in on the Back to the Future voice and text line. Also, let me know your thoughts on the field. If these are going to be the Sixers City Connect jersey, those white Spectrum ones, let me know your thoughts on them. I like them. I, th- I think there's something about a white jersey that just looks clean. Uh, also makes it hard to keep clean, uh, but that is my own issue with wings and beer while I'm watching a game. Phillies off today, gearing up for a huge series against the Mets. Mike Randler, I see you. Be ready, brother. Be ready. This has been This Day in Philly Sports History for September 12th, 2024. My name is Jim Montgomery. Go have yourselves a Thursday, and until next time, I'll see you when I see you.